Get off me, he yelled. He slapped the hand away, then whirled around and shoved the clown as hard as he could in its, mis in its midsection. It hurtled backward, crashed into an arcade cabinet and fell onto its side. Colton was amazed how lightweight the clown was and how far he had been able to push it. Seeing it lying there on the floor, it looked like a broken toy, certainly not anything to be scared of. He got down on his knees and pulled on the cover. It flipped open easily. Clearly, it was a hatch that allowed access to the pulverizer's innards. The opening was small, no bigger than the bathroom window Colton had used to break into Freddy's. Colton dropped his screwdriver inside the door, and then, turning on its flashlight, he crawled into the machine. The space inside was cramped. There was no room to sit up. He could only lie down with his legs bent sideways in an uncomfortable position, with the bottom of the machine's platform touching the length of his body. Shining his flashlight around, he was relieved to see that the mechanical parts looked how he expected them to look. It was just going to be hard for him to do the work he needed to do from an awkward reclining position. Colton squinted at the inner workings of the ticket pulverizer. As he started to loosen a screw, he felt something tightly grip his ankles. He shined his flashlight to see a pair of white gloved hands, one grasping each ankle. The yellow coil arms were stretched out long but they contracted as they pulled his body toward the opening where he had entered the compartment. How could the clown weigh so little and yet be so strong? It had pulled his legs straight and was dragging him out of the machine. Once Colton's legs were outside, he wrenched uh, his right one free and threw a bunch of wild hard kicks that he felt connect with the clown's body. After one particularly forceful kick, the clown loosened its grip on its other leg, and Colton scrambled to get his full body back into the base of the pulverizer. Once he was inside, he closed the hatch he had entered through behind him. The clown's hands were huge, awkward things, and he hoped it would lack the no motor skills needed. Wait, what? The clown's ha hands were large, awkward things, and he hoped it would lack the motor skills needed to pull the hatch back open. Besides, from the strength of his kicks, maybe he put the clown out of commission anyway. Now it was time for Colton to steady his hands and his nerves and do what he came here to do. Even with the flashlight, it took a few minutes for his eyes to adjust to the darkness. It was like being in a small, tight alcove in a cave. Memories of the claustrophobic closet in the back room of Freddy's momentarily rushed back to him. But when he shined his flashlight on the machinery, he smiled. He knew what he needed to do. It was going to be challenging because he needed both hands to do his work. But there was no place to set the flashlight, which he needed so he could see. Finally, he awkwardly secured the flashlight under his left armpit and angled the beam to hit the area he needed to work on. All his reading, planning and obsessing had paid off. Even though he was working under less than ideal conditions, the process of fixing the pulverizer couldn't have gone more smoothly. At some point, he'd realized the trick. Flip these switches to tie the ticket release to the size of the bounces. Loosen these screws to give the platform even more bounce. The little kids would get more tickets, sure, but big kids like Colton would be flush with them. Colton smiled at his achievement. People didn't give him the credit he deserved, he thought. His teachers didn't comprehend who they were dealing with. They thought he was just some regular high school freshman, a C student, average, no different from a thousand other kids. His mom, even though she loved him, didn't give him enough credit either. Only Colton could see the truth about himself. He was brilliant, a mechanical genius. With his newly re realized self-confidence, his luck was sure to change. The thousands of tickets he was going to win from the ticket pulverizer were only the beginning. Colton smiled at his handiwork one last time, then reached over his head to push the small door open so he could climb out and make his exit. The door wouldn't budge. There has to be some kind of mistake, Colton thought. He pushed the door again, harder this time. It still refused to move. It was like it was locked from the outside. But how is that possible? No one was in Freddy's, and even if they were, why would they suspect someone was inside the ticket pulverizer? He shoved it again. It held fast. Colton shined his flashlight around the tiny space, trying to see if there might be another way to get out, a panel that could be removed or something. There was nothing. Colton's flashlight found a small round hole about the size of the head of a bolt. It was just big enough to peek through. Colton closed one eye and looked through the tiny opening with the other. 
All he could see were big green shoes. Clown shoes. It was standing guard there, waiting. If it couldn't get him out of the machine itself, it would wait until he found a way to get out on his own. He thought of an expression his uncle used sometimes, between a rock and a hard place. He had never really understood the meaning of that saying until now. He felt himself starting to shake. His heart thudded in his chest so loud that he could hear it. Somehow he felt sweaty and cold at the same time. The space seemed to shrink around him until it was squeezing him from all sides. He lay with his knees hugged to his chest, trying to make himself smaller so the space would seem larger. It'll be okay, he told himself. In two or three hours, Freddy's would open and somebody would rescue him. But how could he stand to stay in this tiny space, in this uncomfortable position for two or three hours? Was there even enough air to keep him alive that long? Already the air he was breathing felt scarce and stale. And assuming someone did rescue him, how would he explain himself? I was playing jump for tickets last night and I guess I jumped so hard I fell in. Oops. He was going to have to come up with um, a more credible story. Colton looked down at his flashlight. He had no idea how much life the batteries still had in them. It was probably best to try to conserve them. He switched off the flashlight and was plunged into total darkness. He remembered a story he'd read in school about a man trapped in the deep blackness of a coal mine waiting to die. He felt like that man. He tried to let his hand, his mind wander. He made lists of things, favourite video games, favourite movies, favourite foods. But the last one was a bad idea because it made him realise how hungry he was. He usually ate a full breakfast, but today he'd have nothing but that banana. He was thirsty too. It never occurred to him to bring water because he hadn't thought that he might be trapped like this. Colton's stomach lurched, not with hunger but with nausea. The acid from the orange juice he had drunk earlier seemed to be upsetting his stomach but he knew it wasn't really the orange juice that was affecting him. It was fear. Fear was eating away at his insides and making him sick. Don't throw up, don't throw up, Colton told himself. If he threw up in here, he would be trapped in this tiny space with the horrible smell of his own vomit. He sucked in great gulps of air, trying to quell his nausea. But then, he worried, what, was, what, what if he was being too greedy with the air? What if he was using the limited supply of oxygen in this tiny space too quickly? <laughs> Both of Colton's legs had fallen asleep, but there was no room to move them around to wake them up. He wiggled his toes and moved his feet at his ankles, all the time feeling like he was being prickled by hundreds of ne needles. His neck was starting to cramp and he pivoted his head from side to side, trying to relieve the pain. But the pain and sickness weren't the worst parts. The worst part was the question gnawing back. At the, at the back of Colton's mind. What if no one finds me? What if nobody hears me and I die from thirst or hunger? Will somebody find me when my body starts to rot? Or will all that's left of me be a dusty, forgotten skeleton curled up in this compartment for years and years like a mummy in its tomb? But he also knew that curling up and dying inside the machine might not be the worst thing that could happen to him. From outside the machine, he heard jingling as the clown patrolled back and forth in front of the ticket pulverizer. He thought again of the mice who wanted to hang the bell on the cat so they knew, uh, so that they would know when their killer was close. Colson shrugged. Maybe it was better not to know. Clearly, sitting here in the dark, this like this was making him a little crazy. He turned on the flashlight for a couple of seconds as a reality check. At least he knew he could still see. Good. But when he turned off the light and was surrounded by darkness again, he felt scared of, uh, he felt scared of the dark, as though he was a little kid. It was like this terrible experience was making him, uh, sorry, was making him, uh, move backward in time, becoming the child he had once been. The child that he hated, like he hated all children. But wait, Colton remembered something. His phone. He had his phone. If all else failed, he could call his mom confess to his crimes and get rescued. She was probably already home from a shift and wondering where he was. He reached into his back right pocket. It was empty. He tried the left back one, even though he knew he hadn't put it there. He patted down all his pockets frantically, and then a picture flashed in his mind, him setting out the phone and his tools on the floor beside the machine, opening the machine's door and dropping into the tools. Uh, and dropping the tools inside, but not the phone. Colton said some words his mother didn't allow him to say. Then, as if on cue, he heard it, 
a faint ringing coming from just outside the machine. Oh my god. <gasps> his ringtone. He was sure it was his mum calling to see if he was okay. You guys don't know this, obviously, but this... This is one of my worst nightmares. Getting a call f on your phone, but not being able to access your phone and being in danger, if you know what I mean. Like, being able to hear, like... Being able to hear your only source of hope, but not being able to, to like, respond to it, is like my worst nightmare. That's terrifying to me. Oh my god. Okay. Um, <laughs> Colton was not okay. He pushed on the door with his full strength. It was like trying to move a solid brick wall. He pushed on the platform just above him. It was useless. Colton peeped through the tiny hole in the ticket pulverizer's base. He saw his phone on the black and white tile floor, vibrating as it rang. And then a white gloved, three fingered hand reached down and picked it up. No, he screamed. No, no, no. He screamed till his throat was raw knowing the whole time that it wouldn't make any difference. Time passed. How much? An hour. Five minutes. Colton had no idea. In the dark, with nothing to do and nothing to see, time lost its meaning. Other things started to lose their meaning too. Colton started to find it hard to form words in his mind. He knew the physical sensations he was feeling, thirst, hunger, pain from his body being cramped into an unnatural position the uncomfortable pressure of a full bladder. But he couldn't find the words for any of these things. He could only feel them and whimper softly and wait. He wasn't even sure anymore what he was waiting for. Scared, unable to use language or feed himself, in very real danger of wetting his pants, Colton was regressing to the helplessness of an infant. If he continued to go backward physically and emotionally, the next logical step would be to a to disappear into nothingness, to become one with the darkness. For a while it seemed as if it had happened, that Colton had simply ceased to exist. But then he heard it, and if he could hear, it must mean that he existed. It was the music, the bleeping and blipping of the games, the annoying voices of the animatronic characters. Colton remi uh, remembered where he was and what his predicament was. But things were looking up. Noises meant people. If Freddy's was open for business, somebody was there to hear him. He started out by yelling for help, but quickly realised that his throat was too dry and his voice was too weak from disuse to make much noise. Instead, he banged on the platform with his fists. He hit the stupid thing over and over, but with no results. His knuckles ached and he and would probably bruise. He figured no one was nearby and decided to conserve his energy. If he kept banging on the platform continuously, he would only exhaust himself. He would wait a little while until there. Uh, he would wait a little while until there were some customers, then try again, like a cat washing its paws. Colton licked his knuckles, trying to soothe his pain with the moisture of his saliva, but his tongue was too dry from thirst to be of much use. At least now, the terrible darkness was no longer accompanied by silence. If he could hear noises, he knew he was alive. From the sound of little footsteps and high-pitched yelling and giggling, it was clear that Freddy's had now opened for business, and when Freddy's was full of overstimulated rug rats, it was the noisiest place on earth. It was amazing how much Colton could hear from his tiny prison. He could pick out the sounds of different video games. He recognised sound effects of the company BB's ball drop and the annoying jingly tune that played when somebody put in a token to play Dee Dee's fishing hole. He could hear the canned music of Freddy Fazbear's band as they launched into the birthday song. He could hear some obnoxious child whining, But why isn't it my happy birthday? <laughs> this was great. If people were in the pulverizer, even if they were stupid little kids, Colton could get them to notice them. They could tell an adult that they heard screaming under the platform and he would be saved. Colton breathed a sigh of relief. This ordeal would be over soon. He could feel them above him, jostling around and bumping into one another. The platform pressed down on him a little more from their weight. They were giggling and talking on one another in little kid gibberish. Colton suddenly became aware of how urgent his situation was. If the platform was already pressing down on him, more from the little kids just standing there, he had to get their attention before they started jumping. His repair to the machine would make the platform dip even lower into his crawl space. Colton banged on the bottom of the platform. 
Hey, he yelled as loudly as he could. Oh no. I know, I know, I know how this is going to end. All the children are going to jump up and down on the platform and he's going to get squashed. <laughs> it's going to be a brutal death. Oh my god. It's going to be something like that. Hey, as he yelled, as he, sh he, oh my gosh, sorry. He yelled as loudly as he could with his dry, scratchy throat. Hey, I'm down here. Help me, help. He was going to have to try harder if he was going to make himself heard over all the noises of the place, plus the noisiness of the kids themselves. He pounded on the bottom of the platform with his hammer. Help, he screamed. I'm trapped in here. Help, help. Prepare for the ticket pulverizer countdown. Now when I finish counting, everybody jump up and down as hard as you can. All together. The clown's pre-recorded voice said. The children's screams of excitement drowned out Colton's screams for help. Here we go, the clown announced. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now jump for tickets! Overhead, Bella the birthday girl and her six friends jumped in unison. The sound like a stampede of a wild buffalo. The platform dropped, they laughed and cheered, and the tickets fell in like rain. But then something wasn't right. Bella had jumped in the ticket pulverizer lots of times. This time felt different. The platform wasn't dropping as low as usual. The flow of tickets had slowed to a trickle. It's slowing down, she yelled to her friend, Aiden. <gasps> Jump harder, Aiden yelled back. <laughs> yes, Aiden. <laughs> Bella jumped higher and landed with more force. The platform dropped. Some tickets sprinkled down, but it was a light shower, not the flood of tickets Bella wanted for her birthday. Let's all hold hands and jump together, Bella yelled. I don't want to hold hands, Aiden yelled back. Come on, it's my birthday, Bella said. Aiden shrugged and relented, and the seven kids joined in a circle. One, two, three, jump, Bella yelled. The kids leaped, then landed at the same time, forcing the platform down, then up, then down further. Jump! The platform dropped an inch. Jump! And another inch. Jump! And another. Bella and her friends laughed and let go of each other so they could grab the falling ticket. After the next jump though, the platform didn't go any lower. The kids jumped again, but it stayed put. Bella looked out at her dad who was outside the ticket pulverizer, cheering them on. It's not working, she yelled. Jump harder, sweetie, her dad called back. Oh my god. Jump, jump, jump. The kids all jumped with as much force as they possibly could. The platform lowered a tiny bit more, less than an inch, then wobbled a little, then stopped. One lonely ticket fell from the machine's ceiling. Outside the ticket pulverizer, Bella's dad nudged his wife. That game's broken, he said. The platform's not dropping like it should. I think I'm going to go get a manager. He was already looking round, trying to spot who was in charge. Good idea, Bella's mum said. Looking inside the ticket pulverizer, because she could see that even though the children were still jumping away, they were getting increasingly frustrated. The platform was pretty much stationary. In a few minutes, Bella's dad returned with a heavy-set Freddy's employee whose name, tag read Ted, he gave the machine a once-over. You're right, he said. The thing's busted some way. He squatted, reached down under the machine, and turned it off. The children looked shocked by the sudden absence of light and noise. I'm sorry, kids, Ted said, yelling over the general chaos of Freddy's. The ticket pulverizer isn't working right. I need you guys to get out of the machine, but I'll tell you what. Since you didn't get to win much in there, if you all go up to the front counter, the cashier will give you 20 free tickets each. The kids' moods got sunnier as they exited the machine and ran in the direction of the free tickets. The clown animatronic was acting weird too. It was pointing at the base of the machine and grabbing at Ted's arm, as if it didn't want him to go inside the ticket pulverizer. But, of course, it didn't want anything. It was a stupid robot, a stupid robot that seemed to be malfunctioning. Ted shook his head. Was every cheap piece of equipment in this run-down place breaking all at the same time? Ted climbed into the pulverizer and jumped on the platform a few times. It hardly moved, even with the force of all his sample, of all his ample weight. 
though he did think he heard a liquidy squishing sound that, of course, made no sense. He was going to have to call the repair guy. When Ted exited the machine, the clown robot was standing in front of the door. Its face, which was usually wearing a comically huge grin, was now a mask of tragedy, with a downturned mouth and sad-looking eyes. Was a, te was a tear sliding down its cheek? Or was Ted imagining things? Sometimes he thought he should find a more normal place to work. <laughs> Tell me about it. One of the little kids from the ticket pulverizer must have noticed the clown's sad face too because he ran up to it and said, Hey Coils, remember me? I'm your buddy Aiden. Don't be sad, okay? It's, it's bad to be sad. My cousin Colton's sad all the time. That's why I'm saving up my tickets to buy him a present. Oh my god. Oh my god. This, oh my god, wow. The little boy threw his arms around the clown animatronic and it hugged him back, holding him in its springy, coiled yellow arms. Weird, Ted thought, walking past the scene on the way to his office. The ticket pulverizer stood empty, or at least empty as far as anyone could see. Ted returned from his office with a sign that he hung on the machine's door. Out of order. Ah! <laughs> what? Oh my god. Okay. Okay, that was good. That was very... That was... That was an insane ending. Oh my god. Okay, if you guys saw my video the other day about my predictions for, th for this book, um, I was like... Oh yeah, there's going to be an arcade game where they jump and then they get tickets. And I don't know what the real threat is going to be. Because, like, what's what's a threat in a game when you have to jump, you know? Um, but that is, like, per like that's top-notch story-making there. Where, um, of course, the platform goes down. And if you have someone under there, they're going to get squished, essentially. That's so, oh my god, that's creepy. That's so creepy. And I love how it changes perspective at the end. And I love the reveal that Aiden was saving up his tickets to buy a present for Colton. That just makes it so much worse. Oh my god. Wow. That was very cool. Um... Yeah, I don't have many theories for this, apart from the fact that um, the clown is probably infested with agony. Uh, I, I assume I assume the clown is infested with agony. That was a creepy clown. Like, he didn't need to do much. He literally just followed Colton and trapped him in uh, uh, underneath the machine, and that was it. That was it. Um, yeah, that, that story was very effective for me. I really enjoyed it. It's definitely at least an A tier for me, I think. Uh, I really like the creepy stories with weird and uh, wacky endings. Creepy endings. Anyway, that's it. That's it for um, Jump for Tickets, the next one. And the last one in this book is Pizza Kit, uh, which I've heard is also amazing. So, um, yeah, tell me, guys, if you're excited for that. And I'll see you later. Goodbye.